recording. Hello, everybody. Welcome. On behalf of the Center for Crisis Studies and Mitigation at the University of Manchester, my name is David Schultz, and I'm a professor of synoptic meteorology and principal investigator of the center. The purpose of our center is to bring together different researchers across the university working on natural hazards and their impacts on society. This is another one of our continuing webinars in our series that's been going on for the past few months. To stay informed of our activities, please follow us on Twitter at UM Crisis Studies and check out our website for event updates and video postings. The format of today's talk will be as follows. During the seminar, you can enter your questions in the chat box. We'll do our best to get to them all during the question and answer session at the end. For now, let me introduce our speaker. Alan Fitzsimmons is a professor of astronomy at Queen's University in Belfast. His field of research is measuring the properties of comets and asteroids. Highlights of his work have been studying the effects of the collision of comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 with Jupiter, studying the first small asteroid predicted to enter our atmosphere, and investigating the first interstellar objects found passing through our solar system. He has sat on the bodies, including uh, the, the Council of the Royal Astronomical Society and the ESA NASA Hubble Space Telescope Time Allocation Committees. Currently, he is an active member of the asteroid Terrestrial Impact Last Alert System, or ATLAS, and the ESA HERA Planetary Defense Mission. Neither asteroid 4985 Fitzsimmons nor comet C2018X2 Fitzsimmons will hit the Earth, which is a good thing as far as he, concern, as he is concerned. The title of his talk today is called Real and Perceived Risks of Asteroid Impacts. Professor Fitzsimmons, take it away. Oh, thank you very much much Dave and I hope everybody can hear me clearly. Uh, thank you for this invitation to speak to you this lunchtime. Um, I'm well aware that uh, your centre is rather interdisciplinary and at the same time uh, there will be people who know some something about this area, some people who uh, have read a little bit about this area and some people who have uh, don't know much about this area, but have seen a film starring Sean Connery. So I'll try to try to cover all aspects, and hopefully, if you need any more details, uh, we can cover that in the Q and A afterwards. Uh, but effectively, what I'm going to do this lunchtime is I'm going to give you a, a brief introduction to the kinds of things that can impact the Earth, uh, asteroids and comets. Uh, I'd like to give you a little bit of a history, very brief history, uh, in how we've recognized that risk over the past 40 years or so, because that really mirrors how public perception uh, and it has, uh, has evolved over that time of this risk, uh, as well as so-called scientific findings. Uh, then I'll go into a little bit of detail in how we understand this risk and how we evaluate it, what is the chance that we're going to have something else to worry about apart from a global pandemic. And then finally, I'll, I'll end by looking at how we might mitigate that risk or how we are attempting to mitigate that risk and how that links in with, again, public perception. So first of all, let's start with a, a diagram possibly similar to a one that everybody saw uh, when they were at school. Here's our solar system. Uh, we have the sun on the left. And then we have the eight major planets uh, with a few of their moons going out from left to right uh, with the sun, uh, it, it, as I said, over to the left and Earth, uh, third planet, third rock out from the sun. Um, what's not normally uh, indicated in these pictures, or perhaps it's just glossed over, is that apart from the eight planets, and in fact now we have recognized five dwarf planets, uh, smaller bodies orbiting our sun in our solar system, we have literally hundreds of thousands of what we call minor bodies, asteroids and comets. Now the asteroids, uh, generally the vast majority of them live in the asteroid belt uh, between the planets Mars and Jupiter. 
We have another belt of smaller bodies that we have known about since the early 1990s, the so-called Kuiper Belt out beyond Neptune. And the Kuiper Belt is the source of roughly half of the comets that we see in orbits or trajectories moving between the planets in our solar system. And it's the asteroids and comets that have some risk or form this risk of impact with our planet. Now, I've used these terms, uh, asteroid and comet. In fact, when you get into uh, the detail, uh, there's actually a, rather a continuum of small bodies out there, of various sizes, and various physical makeups, and so on. But the effective way to think about them, at least up to first order, is that on the left hand side, we have a, a nice spacecraft image of an asteroid. This is asteroid Ida. It's about 50 kilometers across or 50 kilometers end to end. And asteroids are effectively rocky. Uh, the geology and uh, geophysics of these objects it can be quite different from a normal planet like the Earth. But effectively, if you were standing on it, you'd say, yes, this is made of rock. Uh, on the other hand, on the right hand side, we have comets. And although comets do have solid material, uh, so, uh, small, small dust particles uh, in them and so on, they are predominantly icy or, or roughly 50-50 ice and rock, shall we say. And as you can see in this image, the one difference between comets and asteroids is that uh, when comets are near the sun and their elongated orbits, the sun's heat uh, sublimates those ices and that produces the, uh, the atmospheres and the tails that we see. Now, um, in the field of impact uh, physics and planetary defense, uh, we're pretty sure now that the vast majority of the risk comes from asteroids. Effectively, uh, there are more of them in the inner solar system where the Earth lies. In fact, the risk of uh, impact by a comet is about 1% that of the impact risk from asteroids at the current time. And so generally we concentrate on the asteroids, although you'd be glad to know that when we search for these things, we're not bothered what it is or we find anything out there that may be moving in our direction. Now, in terms of history, uh, the, the history of uh, near uh, uh, near-Earth asteroids and near-Earth comets really started in the end of the 19th century when the first one was found. However, in modern history, I'd say that the, uh, it really started raising in public consciousness in about 1980, when in the classic paper by uh, Father and Son team Alvarez and Alvarez published in Nature that year, uh, they showed that if one looked at the geological record uh, covering the uh, the extinction of the dinosaurs and other major uh, families, uh, life forms, I should say, on Earth 66 million years ago, uh, one could see that there were large amounts of iridium in that layer. And here I've got a, a friend uh, of mine who's a bit of a, a bit of a science freak. They went to Gubbio in Italy to actually visit the uh, the what we used to call the KT boundary layer. And he, I've indicated the rocks below the layer, the, uh, the thin uh, layer marking uh, this transition, and then the younger rocks lying above it. And in those rocks, one finds a, uh, a amount of the rare earth element iridium that, if deposited globally, would be equivalent to that contained within an atom. Ten years later, uh, the smoking gun was found through the identification of the impact crater. Uh, the impact of that 10 kilometer asteroid occurred in the southern Gulf of Mexico 66 million years ago. It can't be seen on a normal uh, map of the Gulf of Mexico because in the last 66 million years, another kilometer or so of sediment and rock have been deposited on top. But if one does gravity mapping in this area, 
one can see quite clearly uh, uh, covering the tip of the Yucatan Peninsula, but one kilometre down, a 180 kilometre diameter impact structure. This is the crater, this is the impact point where the dinosaur killer hit 66 million years ago. So this was all coming into a very nice story. And one thing that, however, that did take us by surprise was that four years later, in 1994, we observed several fragments of actually over 20 fragments of a comet called Comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 hit the planet Jupiter. And the largest fragments of that comet hit Jupiter with roughly the same energy as a 10 kilometer asteroid hits the Earth. And this was a tremendous uh, example given to us by nature of what happens when a large, a relatively large comet or asteroid hits a planet. So on the left hand side, one can see the uh, impact site of one of those fragments. In fact, there are two fragment, two impact sites here on the planet Jupiter. And uh, one can see, however, the main impact where the comet has gone in about a uh, 100 minutes or about an hour and a half previously, one can see a shock wave coming out through, uh, around that impact. And then one can see beyond that a crescent of redeposited material. This is essentially material that it, this is vaporized comet and the ejector from that impact that is that has been thrown out into space and then re-impacted the planet uh, uh, about 20 minutes later. And it's difficult to get the scale of things on here because due to such a large planet, but on the right we have a very nice uh, artist impression by taking that uh, HST, that Hubble Space Telescope image and reprojecting that impact at that point onto the Earth. And one can see, uh, as usual, as we, one expects from Hollywood movies, the impact has occurred in New York because that's what always happens. Uh, one can see the shockwave spreading out through the Earth's atmosphere. And of course, uh, underneath there would be a tsunami as well. Uh, and um, that it looks like we've got about another 10 or 20 minutes before it hits us here in the UK. And then the injector has, in fact, by this stage, covered the entire Earth. But of course, it's also hit uh, the, uh, the Antipodes, the, the other side of the Earth. So nowhere on Earth escapes such a large impact. However, this is um, a, uh, a, a quite, quite a rare event. We know that in the history of the Earth. We don't find many 100 kilometer diameter craters on the Earth, uh, but there are many smaller ones. So, for example, one unfortunate effect of the current pandemic is that earlier this year, I should have been back in Arizona and visiting this place, uh, Meteor Crater, uh, just south of the Grand Canyon, between the Grand Canyon and Flagstaff. And this is a picture I took of Meteor Crater about seven years ago now, when I was last there. Uh, this is a one, uh, just over one kilometer diameter crater that was formed 49,000 years ago, uh, caused by just a relatively small 40 meter or so diameter iron nickel asteroid. And to get a, an impression of the scale of this, uh, this will be the first movie I try. And I hope it's not too stuttery for you. But this is just a shot I took off the crater rim. And I'd been down there before, but a few of my colleagues were going into the crater. And we can just zoom in on the image to see my colleagues there. There they are. So as you can see, that even for a relatively small asteroid impact can produce quite an impressive structure. Now, across the Earth, we have, I think the current uh, count is about 140 confirmed, 130 or 140 confirmed impact structures on the Earth, but many the, uh, the Earth has been hit many more times than that over history. Um, it's just that we live on a geologically active planet with oceans, with wind and rain, with uh, plate tectonics. 
if you really want to know how, what's happened to the Earth, then in a couple of weeks, or get up late tonight if it's clear, get, uh, get up, uh, take a look at the moon in the sky through a pair of binoculars. The moon is next door to us in the solar system. And if it were not for the Earth's atmosphere, and its oceans and plate tectonics and geological activity and er surface erosion, the Earth would look like this. We would be in places saturated with craters caused by asteroid and comet impacts since its formation over the past 4.6 billion years. Now, saying that, we know from dating of the uh, uh, lunar rock samples plus current models of the evolution of the solar system, that the vast majority of, the, of these impacts occurred within the first billion years of our solar system. But even so, this is a stark reminder that this is the, just a natural process. What we are seeing here is the natural process of small parts of the solar system, small bodies, asteroids and comets, hitting uh, other larger bodies in our solar system, including the moon and including the Earth. To get an idea of what the effect might be of such an impact and, uh, today, one can just do a very simple calculation of taking asteroids of various sizes, uh, taking the mean impact velocity, which would be somewhere between 15 and 20 kilometers per second with the Earth, and calculating the energy. And if one does that for 10 kilometer asteroids, uh, one kilometer asteroids, whoops, sorry, or 100 meter diameter asteroids, one can calculate this number of joules of energy. And to put this into context, this is how many Hiroshima nuclear devices that would equate to. And the interesting thing for me is always that if one, uh, one is only introduced to this via, uh, via science fiction shows or TV or film dramas, it's all there's always a very large object heading towards the earth whereas one can see that uh, even a 100 meter asteroid hitting the earth had packed quite a lot of energy just simply through its kinetic energy and so that's where the problems are caused by the release of this kinetic energy now if evaluating what the effect of such an impact would be on today's world, of course, is, is fraught with difficulties. But ever since the 1980s, there's been general uh, agreement within the community that the threshold for global significance would be an asteroid impact where the asteroid is roughly one kilometer uh, across. Um, so here I've got a nice uh, diagram from uh, a congressional report for data from about 10 years ago, and really the numbers haven't changed that much since then. On the bottom, we have the diameter of the asteroid impactor going from uh, just a few tens of meters across up to 10 kilometers, uh, a dinosaur killer. And on the y-axis going up, we have the estimated number of fatalities we might have on average. Uh, and effectively, if one follows the red curve, which is the sum of all the effect of fatalities due to uh, uh, the uh, thermal wave, the shock waves, the earthquakes, tsunamis, and, and firestorms, and so on, then one sees that uh, as, as found almost 40 years ago using models of nuclear winters, that one, when one has an impact of about one kilometer or more, then that's when you get the threshold into significant fatalities across the world. However, that's not to say that we need to, we should uh, ignore the smaller impacts. And that's simply because the, uh, the, the smaller an asteroid is, the more of them are, there are and the more frequently they occur. So um, this is for impacts. And when one thinks of an impact, one thinks of uh, a crater event, but actually uh, there are other, even smaller impacts can still have significance in a local region. 
About seven years ago, I was interviewed by the BBC because there was a cl predicted close pass of a near-Earth asteroid. And in that uh, interview, which appeared on the BBC website, um, I was asked by the interviewer, couldn't we be taken by surprise in the middle of the night by a completely devastating, completely unknown asteroid? And I said, I actually, they've quoted me verbatim here, Yes, we could. I said over the phone, and in fact, the most likely scenario at the moment is that the next impact will occur with very little warning. Now, that interview was given on uh, in February 2013, and in fact, it was last updated. I've got a screenshot here from my, uh, from my web page at 2.55 on the 15th of February that year. 25 minutes later, this occurred over Chelyabinsk in Russia, when a small 18 meter diameter asteroid entered the Earth's atmosphere and exploded in a nail burst at high altitude. One might think that was harmless, but two minutes later, the shock wave reached the ground and caused 1600 casualties and injuries. From the near, in the nearby Russian city of Chelyabinsk. Luckily, no fatalities as far as we know, uh, but some very serious injuries through the collapsing of buildings, walls, windows, and so on. And these smaller airburst uh, events caused by asteroids not managing to make it through our atmosphere, but rather exploding at altitude, happen all the time. Here's a map uh, of the position of all high altitude and sometimes lower altitude uh, airburst events caused by small asteroids entering our atmosphere, as you can see from 1988 up until last week, color coded by the size of the event or the energy, which roughly translates into the size of the asteroid impact. Most of these are from asteroids only really a meter across or so, uh, going up to, uh, as I said, the large red dot, there was the 2013 Chelyabinsk impact from an 18 meter asteroid. So it's clear that we have a range of uh, impacts uh, that occur on the earth. And so the important thing for us is to understand this risk, evaluate the risk and plan around it. So to understand the risk, there are three primary steps. The first is to evaluate the risk of impact through detection of these objects before they hit us, calculate their orbits, and, and basically figure out how often do these things hit us. Second thing we need to do is understand what happens when they hit us. And to do that, you need to understand the physical nature of near-Earth objects, these near-Earth asteroids and near-Earth comets. And therefore, use that information to understand what the consequences of those impacts are. And then finally, of course, uh, one would like to develop necessary strategies for mitigation. And to be honest, the this is what sets out asteroid impacts from all other forms of potential natural disaster. We know hurricanes will hit cities in the future. We know there'll be earthquakes. We know there'll be volcanic eruptions. We know, for example, there'll be major solar flares. But we don't know when. We have to plan ahead and assume just knowing that they will occur at some unknown date in the future. With asteroid impacts, we know they will occur in the future, but we have the ability, first of all, to predict exactly when they will occur, if we can find them first. And because of that, develop further techniques for preventing that impact. So I'll first of all talk about the evaluation of the risk of impact through detection and orbital calculation. So this is what we do. We, we have telescopes. Uh, and we have, uh, these are 
there's quite a few scattered around, although they, up to now, it must be said the vast majority of the, of the discovery work has been done, performed by the United States. And this is the largest, one of the two twin largest telescopes used so uh, uh, currently to perform surveys of our solar system. This is the so-called PanStars-1 telescope in Hawaii. Um, to give you some idea of the size of this telescope, in the bottom right, I've taken a, I've got a picture of myself standing next to the camera that we use to survey the sky every clear night with this telescope and others. That camera has 1.8 billion pixels uh, we, and takes a new image of the sky once every 30, uh, once every minute, I should say, for a bit, well, actually between every 50 seconds and one minute. And those images are piped through special fibers down to sea level. They are analyzed by large computer clusters and within an hour or so, the all moving targets have been found. Now, what do I mean by moving target? Here's a typical image of the night sky, uh, taken with a large telescope. You can see lots of bright dots. Those are stars. There's also some bright things that don't look quite like stars. They appear more fuzzy. And these are distant galaxies of stars out there in the universe. But also in this image, there is a near Earth asteroid near our planet. And the first thing to realize is that when we take images and we, just, we try to find these things out there near our planet, they look just like another star. They are unresolved. They are point sources of light. But because they are in orbit about our sun, just as we are on the Earth, their relative motion gives them away. And if you take repeated images of the same part of the sky, a, an asteroid near the Earth will uh, reveal its presence by moving. So in this sequence of images I took of a near Earth asteroid several years ago now, I'll play the movie and let you spot the near Earth asteroid. Now the movie will loop, so don't worry if you don't spot it immediately. But effectively, it's moving along the bottom half of that image from right to left. And that's a uh, uh, near Earth asteroid 54509. Now, we don't, this is a particular sequence I took for a scientific study. Normally, we don't take tens of images as I've uh, uh, put together here. We would only take four, but that's enough to detect a near Earth asteroid. And once we've done that, once we have over generally the period of 24 to 48 hours followed it across the sky, once we've discovered it, we can then calculate its orbit about the sun. So here I've got a diagram showing the inner solar system. The sun is in the center. We have the planets Mercury, Venus, Earth and Mars uh, going outwards and also uh, an asteroid, a near-Earth asteroid I'll talk about a little bit later, 65803 Didymos. And, uh, and the important thing is that when we find near-Earth asteroids, by and large, they are not going to hit us that time because uh, they are not in the same place as the Earth is. They are a little bit further away or in a little slightly different place in the solar system. But we can then, once we have calculated the orbit with sufficient accuracy, predict its position into the future, basically run the clock forward and calculate where that asteroid will be in the future. And taking into account our measurement uncertainties uh, and our uncertainty of, of the path of that asteroid, its orbit about the sun, we can effectively calculate a probability of that asteroid hitting us in the future. Now, normally our uh, orbital calculations only have sufficient accuracy for doing that for the next 100 to 200 years. But that's a relatively straightforward thing to do. And once we find a new object, and, uh, we, and if there is a potential risk for 
impact, then we send out an alert. These are two publicly accessible websites, one run by the European Space Agency, one run by NASA, where continuously every day when new observations come in of near-Earth asteroids, then the orbits are updated, the risk of impact within the next 100 to 200 years is assessed and if there is some non uh, some significant non-zero risk it is placed on these pages that is done completely independently between the two teams using different algorithms different computer code uh, and therefore the acts as very good checks on each other as to uh, assessing the risk. And so this is basically our risk page in a planetary defense. These tell us that at the moment, these are the asteroids we would be most concerned about. If, are there any to be concerned about, you may want to know? Well, let's have a look. Here's the total number of near Earth objects almost all asteroids, uh, but uh, 111 comets as well included in there, discovered by us by the end of last week, 24,250. The number we know that have been discovered on a definite impact trajectory that were definitely going to hit us, four. All of these four objects are relatively small asteroids, just uh, perhaps between two and four meters across. And in fact, they've all already hit us. They were all found within a day or so of impact coming in towards us. But the important, and because of their small size, there was never any real significant danger from these asteroids. But the important thing for, for us is it tells us the system is working. It tells us that we have the ability to find these objects calculate their orbits and predict an impact. And that's a good thing because the inner solar system is a crowded place. This is a map, uh, not of today, that's, this is a map generated earlier this year of the real inner solar system. Again, the sun is in the center and going outwards in light blue, we have the orbits of the planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth and Mars. The multitude of green dots just outside the orbit of Mars are the asteroids in the main asteroid belt, stretching out from there to halfway to Jupiter or more. Every single red dot in this image, in this map for that particular date, is a near-Earth asteroid, one of those 24 and a half thousand near-Earth asteroids we've found so far. So the good news is that uh, at the moment, we have nothing on the books that is definitely going to hit us. But the other useful thing about the, the, this is that we can predict using these numbers, we can, uh, using these observations, we can extrapolate to find out how many there are as a function of size and therefore how often they hit us. Now, the good news is that the 10 kilometer asteroids, the dinosaur killers, only hit us once on average about once every 100 million years. And there are none coming our way. These asteroids are so big, big enough, uh, so big and so bright that, that we have no problems detecting them with our current telescope technology. And we've found them all. They're not coming near us at the moment. So we're safe from the dinosaur killers. The one kilometer asteroids, if you remember, are uh, the asteroids where um, that's the threshold for global consequences of an impact. These hit us more often, there are more of them. They hit us approximately once every 750,000 years. And if we go down then in size to the 100 meter asteroids, which as we've seen still, uh, still give us quite a wallop, they still pack quite a punch. They probably hit us about once every 15,000 years, although the numbers there are more uncertain, that impact rate is more uncertain. And I can show that in another plot where I've taken uh, one of our more recent estimates on the left-hand side 
uh, of the total number of uh, near-Earth asteroids larger than a certain size in red and plotted against it the number we have as of last week in black. And this shows you that as we go down to one kilometers, we've pretty much found them all. We, are all, we have retired most of that risk from one kilometer diameter asteroids over the past 20 to 30 years of telescopic surveys of our solar system. But whereas, um, as we go down to below one kilometer, as you can see the black and red curves start diverging. And that's because we have not found all the near Earth asteroids at those sizes. On the right hand side, I've plotted against diameter of asteroid approximately the fraction we've discovered. And as you can see, as we, as we get to one kilometer and above, we have found 95% or so of these asteroids. And once we get to three or four kilometers diameter, we've found them all. They are bright enough to, to be easily detectable with current technology. But as we get go below one kilometer in size, as we come to more numerous impacts, which can still cause some significant devastation over local cities or even countries, we have discovered less and less of them. So that's where we are at the moment for discovering these objects. They're pretty safe from the global uh, effects uh, caused by an asteroid impact. We haven't found them all, but we have found the vast majority of them. What about the smaller ones? Well, um, one thing that's quite often um, glossed over in, this, in the public perception of this risk is, understand, is it's important to understand the physical nature of these near-Earth objects because that feeds directly into the impact consequences. What happens when these objects enter our atmosphere and understanding what happens if and when they reach ground level. So I'll just highlight two things that have been quite surprising over the past 20 years of studies of these small asteroids and comets near the Earth. First of all, on the left uh, is the finding that was realized about 20 years ago, or just under 20 years ago, is that the asteroids that collide with us are generally not solid bodies. They're rubble piles. These are uh, accumulations of smaller bits of asteroid, boulders, rocks, and, and so on, that are simply held together by self-gravity. And in fact, this on the left is, a is an image from the Hayabusa spacecraft from Japan, who visited uh, near-Earth asteroid Itokawa, pictured here on the left. It's about 500 meters, half a kilometer from left to right. And as you can see, this doesn't even look like a solid surface. This is just a rubble pile. And that's, as I said, held together by self-gravity and just very, very weak cohesive forces between those, those bits of rock. The second surprise that was realized about 15 years ago now is that quite often when the Earth is hit, it's not hit by just one asteroid. Uh, roughly 15% of near-Earth asteroids are binaries. And I'm not sure if I've got a movie here. Yes, I have. These, this is a radar image of an asteroid, near-Earth asteroid as it passes the Earth. And one can see that as one swatches the main asteroid rotate in these radar images, one can see a smaller object moving relative to it. That is its moon. And although it looks much smaller in these images, that's actually a, mis a misleading nature of this type of data. In fact, that moon is about a quarter the size of that asteroid. So 15% of the time when Earth is hit by an asteroid is actually hit by two at the same time because it's a binary or double asteroid that hits us. Now, the important thing about this, as I said, is that it's, uh, 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 um, and here I'm concentrating on the risk rather than the physics and the science, is that it allows us to more accurately uh, model the impacts of these objects. So here I've got an animation from Mark Boslow uh, at Sandia Labs in the United States, uh, who's used computing, uh, computer simulations to 
uh, try to understand the Tunguska impact of 1908, the largest small body impact that occurred on Earth in the 20th century in Siberia. And if I play the movie, again, I hope it's not too jerky for you, one can see the object comes down. It's an airburst. It doesn't reach the ground, but one can see the shock wave hitting the ground. And actually, the one, out, one reason we knew this was quite a, uh, an energetic event was that uh, a couple of decades later, in the first expedition to this, um, uh, to this site, uh, it was found that 2,000 square kilometers of forest had just been flattened by this impact. And one can continue playing those games. So here's a more recent study by Clemens Rumpf from the University of uh, Southampton, published three years ago, looking at the possible uh, consequences in terms of, uh, of fatalities of uh, impacts if they occurred over Europe. So on the left, we have a map of Europe showing where he had randomly thrown small asteroids and then had evaluated what the consequences would be. Now, the consequences depend, of course, not only on the size of the asteroid that hits and therefore the energy that's released, but also where it hits. Does it hit in the ocean, uh, off, uh, you know, halfway between here and Iceland, or does it hit over Central Europe or possibly in in the Mediterranean. On the right hand side, we have a, a, a one of the, his nice summary graphics from that paper showing that, particularly in the top, the average loss uh, or, or the number of casualties that one would have per impact uh, as a function, as one increase goes to the right, of the size of the impact, going from just uh, one or two meters across where there's effectively no effect up to a 400 meter diameter asteroid. And also he there also estimates the number of casualties uh, from the various uh, physical effects of that impact, be it the thermal, thermal blast, the seismic uh, earthquakes, the cratering, the re-entry of the ejector, or the tsunamis if it's an ocean impact, or, or, or perhaps one in the Mediterranean. And one can see quite clearly that, um, uh, the, again, as expected, the larger the impact uh, the more likely you are to have significant casualties from one of these uh, events. So finally, but just uh, as we go to the last section here, uh, in terms of understanding the risk, given that we are now very uh, getting very good at detecting these objects and understanding what happens when they hit, we uh, it's a case of developing mitigation strategies. And this is where, unfortunately, uh, one meets the downside of working in this area, because this is where, of course, public perception plays a role, because we've had a number of big budget films over the years, and given the news uh, 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 over the past few days, I couldn't help but put Sean Connery in there on the left with this classic film, Meteor. Uh, but uh, one can sit down with one's, one's partner to view one of these movies, and I guarantee you that halfway through, they'll look at Sean Connery or Bruce Willis on the, on the small screen, then just turn to you and look at you and turn back to the screen again without saying a word. Um, but, but of course, uh, uh, in these movies, it's always going to be a, uh, a, a, a tremendously large asteroid or something that hits us. And as we've seen, in fact, much of the risk these days is from the smaller impacts. But how can we prevent an impact? Well, the idea is quite simple. In all of these movies, by the way, you try to blow up the object. That's not what we do. What we try to do, in theory, is deflect the asteroid, move it onto a different path or a different orbit so that when the asteroid should have been trying to occupy the same bit of the solar system as the Earth, it doesn't because it's on a different orbit and so it passes by. And these are the three main asteroid deflection technologies that we are have put a lot of work into over the past 20 years or so. 
th there are many others that have been hypothesized, I should say, but we believe we have the technology today to actually instigate one of these mitigation efforts. On the left, we have the gravity tractor, where one hovers, literally hovers a large spacecraft over a small asteroid and uses the gravitational pull of that spacecraft on the asteroid to gently and very slowly pull it into a different orbit. In the middle, we have the less sophisticated approach of what we call the kinetic impactor. And in the kinetic impactor, it's very much a game of cosmic billiards. You take a, a, a spacecraft, you move, you slam it into the asteroid at a high velocity, a few kilometers per second. And conservation of momentum means that asteroid gets a kick and mo is moved into again into a slightly different orbit. On the right is blast deflection, and this is effectively what you'll see in the movies, except in the movies, they always try to uh, completely dis disintegrate the asteroid. Uh, in reality, what you would do is you take a high explosive and or basically a nuclear device and explode it above the surface. And the energy of that nuclear detonation vaporizes the surface of the asteroid below. And again, that vaporized material goes off in one direction and conservation of momentum means the asteroid moves in the other and you've moved the asteroid into a different orbit. Now, one has to be careful about these, okay? Because this is something we have not attempted. There is no rocket sitting on the launch pad waiting to save us. There is no effective mitigation at the moment against to, to prevent an asteroid impact. And one has to be careful about this because in this scenario, I've got I, I've taken my hypothetical asteroid and I'm going to get it to hit Central Europe. And what we'd like to do is move it so that it doesn't. Now, normally the deflection point uh, for your uh, that you're day for would be at least one Earth radius above the Earth, so two Earth radii from the center to make sure that you've moved the asteroid so it will not hit the Earth. But what if your technology goes wrong? What if you only move it halfway? And instead of hitting the Earth in Central Europe, for example, it hits in the Middle East, or it hits off the coast of France in the Mediterranean, where all the nuclear reactors are. And you've got a Fukushima type event. These kinds of things uh, are heavily debated at our planetary defense conferences. It's also a fact that the type of technology we would use depends on how much warning time we have and the size of the asteroid. Now, each potential impact is slightly different, but it's nicely summarized in this graphic. Uh, where we have the warning time in years. I, how much warning time do we have where we say, yes, there's probably going to be an impact from that asteroid against diameter going up in the diagram. If we're dealing with a one kilometer diameter asteroid or so, we have no choice. The only technology we would have at the moment would be nuclear blast deflection. That's the only thing we have in our current technology that would be effective. However, as I've already said, we have already found most of the, retired most of that risk. So that's a good thing. As we go down to the 300 to 100 meter uh, range, we have kinetic impactors. If we have a warning time anywhere up to about 20 years or so, we could use a kinetic impactor. If we have longer or the asteroid is smaller, we could use a gravity tractor. But if we go down to about 50 meters or smaller, our problem is that at the moment, we don't have the technology and the ability to detect those objects coming in and we won't have the warning time. So generally with 50 meter objects or below, we believe civil defense is the most likely outcome for any uh, asteroid impact mitigation. And that means evacuation. 
we won't be able to stop that asteroid. What we will have to do is simply uh, get warnings out and evacuate the regions where that impact is going to occur. Oops, right. Now, between the nuclear options, which to be honest, very few of us in the community want to use, and it looks like we may not have to use anyway, and civil defense, uh, where we have very little warning time or the object so small, it's difficult to know for certain it's going to hit us until it's too late. Then we have kinetic impactors. And that's what's going to happen over the next few years. We're going to have the first test of uh, the kinetic impactor technology through a joint project for, with NASA and the European Space Agency called the Asteroid Impact Deflection Assessment Mission. And what we're going to do is not actually impact, well, we are going to impact a small asteroid, but that asteroid itself is the moon of a larger asteroid. And we're going to basically run a spacecraft called the DART spacecraft into the small 180 meter diameter moon of a larger asteroid called Didymos. And the DART is still on schedule for launch next summer, and it will impact this small asteroid moon at the end of September 2022. And images from a, from a small CubeSat on board plus Earth-based observatories should show us that we have successfully changed that orbit of that small moon about the larger asteroid and therefore shown we can move a small asteroid. That will be followed up by the European half of the mission called HERA that will be launched in four years time and we will arrive at the Didymos system at the end of 2026. And its job is to find out exactly what happened to that small 180 meter diameter moon when the DART spacecraft hit it in 2022 and also measure the mass of that small asteroid moon because DART will show us that we can move a small asteroid. HERA will tell us what we moved and be able, we'll, from that we'll be able to complete the experiment and know exactly how effective this kinetic impact of technology is. So finally then, the next step uh, beyond that is of course to find more of the small asteroids. And I've just put up this slide briefly because currently it, under construction is the Vera Rubin Observatory in Chile. This will be the largest telescope ever constructed uh, whose, one of, whose primary roles or one of its primary roles is to survey the solar system for small near Earth asteroids. The picture on the left is a picture I grabbed from the webcam on the su summit two days ago. It's well under construction and it should start surveying at the end of 2022 or because of COVID uh, delays in, in the construction, possibly early 2023 now. And by the mid 2030s, we should have a catalogue of not only all the one kilometre and larger asteroids that could potentially hit us, but we'll have should have at least 80% of all the asteroids that could make it down to the ground and produce a cratering event. At that point, it's up to the politicians, of course, because all of this, whether or not you uh, uh, launch a, a deflection mission depends on your uh, on, on the money coming from the people that had the money. And I thought uh, perhaps a last slide to put up, given the date, would be this headline from Time magazine uh, that appeared earlier this year. So one's view on whether or not we should perform a mitigation mission may change depending on your political point of view. But then here's my summary. Asteroid impacts are natural disasters that can potentially be predicted to the second, remember. The good news is that almost one, all one kilometer near Earth asteroids, uh, which can cause global, have got global consequences if they hit, have been discovered. And that should, that 
catalog should be complete over the next 10 years. Most, however, sub-kilometer near-Earth objects, asteroids and comets, still remain unknown. And so we need to uh, advance that discovery rate, which we are currently hoping to do with the Vera Rubin Observatory. We also have our first test of mitigation technology taking 